This is the Garden of English. I'm Tim Freitas, and today I have a extremely special guest, um, and we are going to talk about how to identify lit techniques without potentially even mentioning lit terms. So I encourage you to stay tuned. All right, so today we get to actually peel back the veil a little bit because this is the other counterpart in the Garden of English. This is Scott Diesenhaus. He was actually my senior year English teacher. I don't look that old. I know. Well, <laughs> we're, we're not getting any younger. But anyway, uh, so Scott has been instrumental in developing a lot of the Garden of English things that I have produced and put on the website um, and he really is the person that I go to for almost all of my English teaching advice. So it was really important that I bring him in uh, because he's also one of my closest friends. And uh, I said, it's time, it's time for you to get on camera. So I'm happy to be today's here. Thanks the day. For inviting me. Uh, so the reason why I brought Scott in today is because we're going to talk about uh, a common issue that's been brought up to us uh, in AP Lit. And that's talking about lit techniques um, and trying to get kids to really specifically talk about lit techniques um, without jumping straight to abstraction um, or abstract concepts, but also how do we get kids to label lit techniques that will guide their writing? And uh, Scott and I do it the same way in AP language as we do in AP lit. So today we're going to talk about lit techniques, okay? Um, so the first thing that I want to do is when we think about literary terms, we think about, uh, you know, metaphor, simile, and all those other things. Uh, but lit techniques is we don't actually have to use that terminology. We have to explain what the author is doing. So if you were to, if you were to give me a definition for lit techniques, what would you say? Exactly that. It's what the author is doing in the text okay. to accomplish his or her purpose. All right. So uh, it's interesting that you brought that up because we have in order to accomplish his or her purpose. So if I were to read something and say, all right, so the author characterizes Billy Joe as mean, is that the lit technique that I want to pinpoint? Not precisely. Okay. It's a little too big. And because that's our purpose side, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So now what we what Scott and I want to do here today is we want to show you all how can you actually pinpoint with the lit technique what's the language in the text, and then we have that purpose side of it, which is to characterize so-and-so as a jerk, right? right? Yes. Okay, super cool. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to link uh, give, give you a link to the PDF of Most Dangerous Game. Um, and that's going to be found right down below in the description. And I'm going to have you pause the video in just a minute, and I'm going to just encourage you to read the first two pages, or at least the first page, um, and just so you can get a feel of what's going on. And that's going to actually help you as we talk through this with you over the next five minutes. So we're going to pause it right here. Okay, so we're going to assume that you paused. I'm going to actually shrink both Scott and me up now um, as we bring up a new window. And when that happens... We're going to talk about most dangerous game here. Focus so. on something far prettier than us. <laughs> That's for sure. All right, so we're all shrunk up here, and we are going to assume that you read the first two pages of Most Dangerous Game. If you just read the first two paragraphs, you'll be able to do what we want to do with this. So yes. what we're going to try and do is we're going to try to talk about how, um, how do we label these lit techniques without actually saying lit terms, okay? Um, and I think, you know, what are kids, I mean, we're at the beginning of the story, so where, where are we in our, plot, in our plot diagram? We're looking at our exposition. So if we were to label this in a terrible way, but we thought we were doing it right, what would we say that this lit technique is? Expository detail. Okay, so the author uses expository detail mm -hmm. in order to whatever. Or maybe sometimes kids just write the author uses expository detail. Yeah, sometimes that's all we see. Why? And that's a problem why? Because they're not providing us with any purpose. Okay. And they're not being descriptive enough. We, there's a lot of expository detail in this text. In fact, later on when Rainsford meets Zaroff, we see, find a lot more expository detail in the text. <laughs> so, because, so. so because of that, right, we want to say that lit techniques point us directly to a specific area yes. in the text. And we want it to be extremely clear where that is. So uh, if we look at this language that Scott and I have marked already for you all, the first part of what we're looking at actually deals with setting. So does that mean that I have to actually use the word setting? Not necessarily, no. Okay, so let's actually talk about this here. Um, some kids might want to just say, you know, Richard Cannell describes the setting to create a mood. But that's not going to help because it, what's right. our setting? What's our mood, right? And even adding an adjective like Richard Cannell describes the ominous setting to create a mood doesn't really provide 
that much more in detail. Right, because, well, where is that ominous setting? Which right. text are we going to use? So when we label our literary choices, we want to try to really drive home what text we're talking about. So yes. let's actually look at what we have going on right up here where we have Ship Trap Island and the sailors have a curious dread of the place and it's some superstition. Instead of saying Richard Connell describes an ominous setting, what could I label this as that I that I could point towards that textual evidence here? Well, it's kind of folklore, sailor lore. Okay, so I but I can't say Richard Connell has sailor lore. Well, he references it. There we go, right? And actually, he even has the character Whitney reference it. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking about character yep. and what the character says. So we've got character and dialogue mixed into one here. Yes. So Richard Connell has Whitney reference old sailor lore mm -hmm. and comment on the sailor's behavior to create, well, what kind of mood does that create? We have an ominous mood. There we go. Yes. And so now we've connected what's concrete and what's abstract here. So would it make sense for you to have a topic sentence, though, that just says that Richard Connell creates an ominous mood? It's ineffective. I don't know where, when, right. what point in the text. So we're trying to pull out here what text are we talking about so that as we create a, a topic sentence for a paragraph, we know exactly what text to talk about. So it would be way better if yes. we said Richard Connell has Whitney reference sailor lore in the sailor's odd behavior to create an ominous mood. Yeah, we want to see our students looking at author's purpose, talking uh, in ways that demonstrate that the author is doing something concrete, which means that they're looking at the text concretely, some element from the text, in order to do something abstract. Right. And in doing that, they're making connections. They're demonstrating abstract and critical thinking. Right. Then that's And that's what we're trying to pull out here. Mm -hmm. And now if I just label this as sailor lore, and he has Whitney, uh, you know, reference or re recount some sailor lore. And his like that, recount. Yeah. Yes. And his description of um, the sailor's odd behavior, and it creates an ominous mood. I don't even need to say mood, to be honest with you. I can just say atmosphere. Uh, yep. And I don't have any lit terms in that sentence, but I'm still referring to character, dialogue, and mood all yes. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we know that we're dealing with actual literary elements. Super cool. And that's for setting. But notice that there's other stuff that we've underlined up here for setting as well. That dank tropical night, that thick warm blackness, mm -hmm. that moonless Caribbean night. And I think about the, the setting there, and it's in the Caribbean Sea. Okay. So now we know that it's dark, so we can just say he describes the yeah. dark Caribbean Sea. Yes. And that yeah. helps create that kind of eerie mood. I could say an he describes an uncomfortable night on the dark Caribbean Sea to create mm -hmm. an eerie mood. Yeah, sometimes students get fixated on terms. Right. And they want to impress teachers by demonstrating their understanding of terms. But in doing so, they overlook what's actually happening in the text. And, you know, think about this. If you actually have Richard Connell describes a dark, uncomfortable night on the Caribbean Sea, which creates an ominous atmosphere, mm -hmm. that shows me so much more about a kid's yes. understanding besides the kid saying he presents a dark setting to create a mood or to create mm -hmm. an ominous mood. Mm -hmm. It's really pulling out what parts we're going to. Yeah. And that technique right, describing that dark setting on the Caribbean Sea or that dark, uncomfortable night on the Caribbean Sea points us to one place yes. right here. And that's how we know that this lit technique is actually labeled correctly. So let's actually shift down just a little bit so that we don't just only talk about setting. We're still in the exposition, but here we have a conversation between Rainford and Whitney. Um, but I don't want to just say Richard Connell has... Dialogue. Know, <laughs> yeah, of course, right? Presents a dialogue between the two. Yes. Because I think that there's a better verb yeah, we that wanna, we can pull here. Yeah, we want to look at what these two characters are actually doing here. And when we consider what these characters are doing, they're arguing. Right. So now we can actually say something along the lines of Richard Connell has... Describes an argument. Yep, or, or depicts. Depicts. Right, yep. depicts an argument between... Uh, two friends mm -hmm. in order to. And if you read this here, what's the in order to? Well, he's working to characterize Rainsford as arrogant. Okay. Yeah. And he's also Ultimately, showcasing it, um, Rainsford as yes. this hunter, but not so that we can know he's a hunter, but that he's got this predatory nature. Yes. And sure enough, mm -hmm. once he disagrees with Whitney, he jumps right down his throat like a predator, mm -hmm. right? Like, yes. no, I'm going to assert my dominance over you. Yeah. And we can see that in right here. But like you said earlier, this is the exposition. And if a kid says, oh, the author uses expository details at yes. the beginning of his piece. In order to characterize Rainsford. 
we're not really said nothing. Yeah, exactly. He uses the beginning of the piece to show some guy's character. Mm -hmm. No, he uses the argument between two friends yes. to showcase Rainsford's that's predatory funny, nature. Yes. I mean, that's going to be a way better paper that shows way better understanding. Yeah, and again, they're pointing very concretely to a part of the text that illustrates that idea. Absolutely. And so now that's going to help them as they develop their paragraph because when we have you know, presents this argument between two friends to showcase the predatory nature of one. All right, where's the argument seen? That's the next part of your paragraph. Right. And then how does that argument in and of itself that you extrapolated on now show the predatory nature of Rainsford? That's There's your, your analysis. paragraph. Yeah. And you have connected mm -hmm. exactly what a lit technique is. Anything the author is doing for the purpose. Yep, well, the purpose is to characterize Rainsford. Here's what he did. He presented these characters an argument. And now we've done exactly what we said we would do. Perfect. Right? So yes. anyway, nonetheless, it's super nice to have uh, Scott here with us. It's super nice to see him when we can. Super uh, nice to be here. Thank please, you. Please note that we do have these verbs for literary analysis for sale um, on the Garden of English resources .weebly.com. If you don't want to support us in that way, though, that's fine, because you can actually access this information for free as well on the resources on the Garden of English resources .weebly.com. But the easiest way that you can support us is just by clicking like and subscribe. You can follow us on Instagram. You can also check us out on Facebook and like us there uh, to keep up with everything Garden of English, or you can completely ignore all of those things and just watch these videos because they're completely free as well. Uh, but I forgot to mention, we also have t-shirts, and Scott's actually rocking one right now. It's a little dark on the language, but that's okay, uh, because you don't have to get one that dark. Um, so anyway, I really appreciate Scott being here. Uh, thank, thank you very you much so for much. having me. And um, until next time. All right. All right. Take care. Awesome.